My first response, like anybody else, was, uh, come on, you must, you must have been watching a movie channel. You were not watching the news channel. She got more excited. No, 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 you open the TV. Switch on the TV. And I did. I did. And the world was not the same. Not for me. Not for anyone else in this room. This perpetrator of this ghastly attack, as you all know, was finally tracked down and killed in Abbottabad. Abbottabad is an elite Pakistani military base. Indeed, if the US SEALs had flown for just another 11 minutes in the helicopter that they were traveling in, they would have landed in Srinagar, which is the capital of Jammu and Kashmir. Most Indians, actually, do not realize that Abbottabad is just about 123 kilometers from Srinagar. You know, that is, if Srinagar is beaten, Abbottabad is New Orleans. The concept of Baton Rouge and New Orleans being two different cities and two independent nations, both south, outlandish. Please uh, also realize that the concept of Abbottabad and Srinagar being parts of two different foreign nations would have sounded equally outlandish to the present day Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, even when he was a teenager. India and Pakistan are geographic uh, rea uh, neighbors, and nothing can change this reality. Naturally, we have a stake in, ordinary citizens of India and Pakistan have a stake in having peaceful relations between our countries. But we all know today world is a, world is a village, and nothing brought home this stark reality than the fact that the madman sitting in a cave in Afghanistan managed to attack mainland America something which had not happened in two world wars in the 20th century. His eventual death in Abbottabad, and Abbottabad is a place which is most likely to have a sizable nuclear arsenal, brought home the chilling reality that he was very close to laying his hands on the nuclear arsenal in that place. He was not. Osama bin Laden, you know about Abbottabad, was not a peaceful pensioner. By all accounts, once he was scheming, he was plotting, he was, he was conspiring to commit more and more acts of terror. And in case he had managed to lay his hands on that nuclear arsenal, the horrors that he could have unleashed would have eclipsed 9-11 by a degree which is unimaginable. It is therefore my contention that it is therefore in the strategic interest of the United States of America to understand how Abbottabad came to harbor the most dreaded terrorist in the world, while Srinagar manages to be a normal city. Forgive me, I, I, I don't mean any offense, but just to rephrase the statement in, in, a, in a way that will bring this reality closer to your uh, imagination. The question that I ask is, how come within a generation, New Orleans, I mean, just in terms of a hypothetical question, came to be, in a, in, 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 in a span of one generation, it comes to be the head of a global uh, terror activity while Baton Rouge remains what it is. And that is the question I seek to answer now. <coughs> of course, uh, before moving on, eradicating base for terrorism is not the only strategic interest the United States of America has in Indo-Pak relations. On a more positive note, India and Pakistan account for one-fifth of the world population. So out of every five people in the world, one is either India, Indian, or Pakistani. In last one decade, uh, there's been an exception this year, but in last one decade, Indian economy has grown at 8%. Now we are, this year, I think, we grew close to 5 or 6%. Some of the Indian states have grown at more than this, at more than 10% per year. Pakistan has the same potential. And today we are frittering away our resources and building uh, bigger and bigger nuclear arsenals. And the expensive folly of both these nations is demonstrated in one conflict we have in Himalayas, 
in a glacier called Saichin Glacier. It's the highest battleground in the world, where India and Pakistan have fought internationally since April 13, 1984. Both countries maintain permanent military base at a height of 6,000 meters. And more people, more soldiers, Indian Pakistani soldiers, have died because of natural causes, because of frostbite, because of avalanches, than because of any bullet fire. India is estimated to spending about $50 billion, or 2.5% of its GDP, on uh, military purposes. If it manages to reduce it to a level of, let's say, Canada or uh, Germany, which is about 1.3% of GDP, it will free up about $25 billion per year. That's enough money to make investments in building public infrastructure in India, which will conservatively add about 2 percentage points to the GDP growth, taking it to a level of tendency. So what we are really saying is, within a decade, a market rivaling the size of China will open up for trade and commerce if the hostility between these two countries can be reduced. So thus, from perspective of safety, which is reducing terrorism, as also from boosting economic growth by access to a significant and growing market, the United States of America has a deep and abiding strategic interest in indo pakistan if this is so, uh, let's spend some time understanding uh, why these two nations have come to have a, such a hostile relationship. There are many reasons, there are many reasons. But to me, the primary reason is uh, what is it that happened in 1947, when these two nations became independent nations from colonial rule of the British. I'll just make three statements, and that will bring to you the horror of what happened in those days. What happened in those days was, in a span of three months, just three months, 12 million people were rendered homeless, and they had to travel across borders to locations they had never been alive before as refugees. 12 million people. One million people was slaughtered, murdered. Half a million women were abducted and raped. This is the horror of what happened in 1947. And there is one, one, uh, one man, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, uh, not man, I would say, one human being, uh, which is Mahatma Gandhi, fought to prevent this genocide. And for his efforts, he was finally murdered. I have some video clippings which I can sh share with some of you if you are interested in video. So the blood spoiled in the partition riots actually continues to poison the indo nations. It is therefore under important to understand what happened and why it happened. Did people really go mad? Or there was some design, some ulterior motive behind this. But that's, that's one part I'm not going to go, go into right now. Let's move on to the third part which is, uh, which is uh, more familiar to us, which is using collaborative powers of information and communication technologies to bring about a social change. You know, whether Indian and Pakistani people went mad in 1947, or there was ulterior design, uh, we need to know that that may perhaps lessen the mutual hatred. But as Aristotle once said, even God cannot change the past. But the future for, is for us to me. So let's now turn to what we can do about it, which is to build a better future. All of us know that we are in the middle of an unprecedented era in human civilization where everything around us is changing and changing on a daily basis. Getting over past was never easy. In fact, like it or not, our past is dissolving in front of our eyes. The generation today and the generation before has a huge difference in terms of perceptions and other things 
than ever before between two generations. Let's take uh, some, some uh, business examples, corporate examples. You know, I was a corporate controller of uh, Bayer in India in 1998, and uh, the IT department had put up a proposal for introducing emails. And uh, please don't laugh, but we asked them to justify and give a ROI calculation. In uh, 2003, when I joined a family-owned uh, company, a large family-owned company, Bombay Dining, the chairman would not hear of introducing ERP. In 2013, having an ERP or having an email is just a necessary cost of existence. Most of us participate in virtual teams, and we collaborate across time zones and geographies. In fact, uh, uh, Professor Barika and I keep on talking to each other all the time, and that's how this particular uh, research has been going on. In this digital world, the intervening mountains, deserts, oceans do not matter to us. We just collaborate. On the other hand, the use of ICTs for bringing about a social change is as yet an emerging phenomenon that remains relatively uncharted. You know, to give an example of Egypt, which is still undergoing a turmoil. Let's understand what happened in just two years back, 2011. On 25th of January 2011, President Mubarak was firmly in saddle, as he was for three decades before. And by 11th February, he was out of power. Now, today there is a news that he may be released once again. How did this come to happen? The reasons are complex. And behind the scenes of NGOs and Facebook-driven protests, there are huge structural and economic forces and institutional realignments which are going on, and which in Egypt, as all of us know, are still not complete. That's still going on. There are actually three, three basic trends in Egypt. One is a group of new movements, which are organized by and around international norms and organizations. Uh, leading to secular, globalizing set of perspectives and discourses. The second is a group which is very active, assertive, uh, legal culture and independent judicial institutions in Egypt. The strong culture is certainly not, quote unquote, a Western human rights uh, import. Lawyers, judges, millions of litigants, men, women, working class, people, farmers, elite, have kept alive this judicial system and have a long proof, unbroken history of resistance to authoritarian regimes. And the third is a group of new social movements which represents the intersection of the first the internationalist NGOs, the judicial rights groups, the new leftists, the feminists, the workers and the social movements. And when these three groups, these three diverse groups collaborated using ICTs, using Facebook, using Twitter, emails, SMSs, a revolution took place, and a revolution which is still going on. India also witnessed its first